Okay, hi, nice to meet everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Wong, I'm uh, the epileptologist working in the um, epilepsy division of a neurology department. Um, so today we're gonna talk about um, epilepsy, you know. Um, these are the learning objectives uh, for this um, topic. Uh, we're mainly just gonna focus on the seizure classification because I think that's the basic for us to, to understand how to approach a patient with seizure and how to manage them. Um, and then um, I'm gonna talk about evaluation of seizure etiology, the treatment of seizures, and at the uh, towards the end, uh, I'm gonna talk about a very commonly seen uh, seizure mimicker in our clinical practice, uh, which is the non-epileptic episodic events. Um, so some uh, background information uh, about um, epilepsy. Uh, so back in uh, 1870, um, Dr. Hewlins Jackson, uh, which is a very well-known British neurologist, postulated that seizures were due to an excessive and disorderly discharge of cerebral nervous system um, on the muscles. And our modern electrophysiology um, offers no evidence to the contrary. So, so he, he was right at the beginning back in 1870. Seizures are a common occurrence. Um, the, by estimation, this uh, disorder affects the estimated uh, eight to 10% of the population over a lifetime. Um, they also account for um, one to 2% of all emergency room um, visits. In uh, 2005, the seizure definition was updated to a transient occurrence of signs and or symptoms due to abnormal excessive or synchronous neuronal activity in the brain. Um, so the uh, patients may, may ask you, do I have epilepsy or do I just have seizures? And actually they, this, uh, in, these are basically talking about the same because epilepsy uh, basically refers to a situation when a individual has an epileptic seizure and his or her brain demonstrates a pathologic and enduring tendency to have recurrent seizures. So in that, with that definition, um, epilepsy can be diagnosed when an individual had at least two unprovoked or reflex seizures in more than 24 hour, uh, over more than 24 hour apart. If, or if a patient has a unprovoked or reflex seizure, and also has a probability of at least 60% of having another seizure within the ten, next 10 years. And how do we identify people who will have at least 60% of risk of having another seizure in 10 years? In, uh, in that case, uh, we need to do MRI and EEG. And if they have a abnormal MRI or if they have a, a abnormal EEG, um, then they are considered to be at that high risk. Epilepsy can also be diagnosed when an individual has an epilepsy syndrome. We're going to talk about that in further detail. Okay. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, seizure classification is going to be a topic we're going to focus mainly during this talk because I think that's the basic. Um, the purpose of uh, classifying seizure types is to generate a transparent language so that when we say words, we mean what they say. Okay. Um, the, the seizure classification has, has um, the system has, um, you know, has been updated several times uh, by the International League Against Epilepsy. Um, in the past, we used to separate seizures uh, into either partial seizure versus a, versus a generalized seizure. And we used to say partial complex or simple, complex, uh, simple partial. Um, and then they, um, the, uh, the International League Against Epilepsy added uh, a classification of idiopathic versus uh, 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 symptomatic in 1985. Um, so it, you can see what people are just trying to, to make um, added, editing to the naming system just to make sure we, uh, we get a more transparent language. Um, the most updated uh, um, you know, classification system was published in 20, uh, 2017 um, by the International League Against Epilepsy. This is published um, in uh, 2017 on epilepsy. Um, these are the, uh, the, the papers um, by the, by the uh, committee. So uh, 
basically the uh, in the current classification system seizures can be divided into focal onset generalized onset and unknown onset and under focal onset we can further divide the seizures into seizures with intact awareness and seizures with impaired awareness so when a patient when a patient is having a focal seizure the awareness is determined by whether the person knows who they are and what is going on in his or her surroundings during the seizure. It does not refer to awareness of the seizure occurring, okay? And the awareness is impaired for any portion of the seizure. Then uh, it doesn't need to be uh, during the entire seizure. If, if the patient has a uh, impaired awareness during any portion of the seizure, then that seizure is classified as a focal seizure with impaired awareness. And furthermore, uh, focal seizures can be divided into uh, motor symptom at onset or non-motor symptom at onset. And sometimes patients ha can have a generalization. You know, in the past, we used to say secondary generalization. When the, when a patient had a intense uh, seizure that starts at, as a focal uh, symptom and then gradually uh, evolves to a generalized tonic-clonic uh, movement. And, but now the term is changed to focal to bilateral tonic clonic. And the same thing with generalized onset seizures, uh, the, it can be further divided into motor symptom at onset and non-motor symptom at onset. Same thing with unknown onset type, okay? So in that definition, focal onset seizures just means the seizure originates within the networks limited to one hemisphere. Okay, certainly this um, seizure activity can, can be uh, just localized to that hemisphere, or it may be more widely distributed to involve both hemispheres. Um, and uh, in further detail, uh, the, the motor onset um, can, be, uh, can be some uh, automatisms, uh, which is a commonly seen symptom uh, in temporal lobe onset seizures. Uh, I don't know whether you have uh, rotated with us um, and have seen some uh, temporal onset, uh, temporal lobe seizure patients. The automatism can uh, manifest as a lip smacking, um, chewing, uh, or swallowing, or just uh, sometimes it can be a manual automatism, which means the patient will have purposeless movement with, her, with their hands. They may fidget. Um, and, and, you know, just grabbing on their shirt or, uh, you know, playing uh, um, stuff in their hand, purposeless, okay? Um, and uh, another example of motor onset symptom uh, is atonic uh, or clonic. Clonic means that the, the patient will have a repeated, regularly spaced jerky movements. Um, and on the other hand, mild clonic seizure, in contrary, is a irregular and not rhythmic jerky. So all these are, are some examples of motor onset symptoms with a focal onset. Non-motor onset, for example, we, we can see autonomic, uh, which can be a change in heart rate, blood pressure, sweating, pelorection, or GI sensations, uh, or it can be a behavioral arrest. Um, you know, patient may say, I stare off, I zone out. Um, some patients may report they have a deja vu. That's another uh, commonly uh, reported symptom in temporal lobe epilepsy, uh, which can be considered a non-motor cognitive uh, symptom. Um, some patients may report emotional change, such as uh, fear, anxiety, or just pleasure, um, or uh, sensation change, um, such as a funny taste, a funny smell, or hearing things, uh, vision change, seeing spots, things like that. So these are also uh, all examples of symptoms that, be, that can be uh, identified by taking history uh, from the patient and or family. Um, on the other hand, uh, generalized onset seizures originate at some point within the brain and it can rapidly engage bilaterally uh, distributed networks. So the, although the, the, the initial uh, onset may be a spot of the brain, however, the, the uh, ictal activity quickly uh, spread to evolve, evolve a uh, wide network of the, of the entire brain, okay? 
uh, and it, it, the, the ICTO activity and can include cortical and subcortical structures. Um, and uh, again, generalized onset seizures can also be further divided into uh, uh, motor symptom at onset, which is similar, sort of similar to the focal onset and, and some non-motor onset symptoms uh, at onset. Um, these are, you know, I, I won't, I won't go into details of, of, of these, you know, um, if you want to read about these, uh, you can uh, have that uh, reviewed on your test textbook. So just to review the, uh, the concepts we have already talked about, um, here are some clinical um, examples of how, you know, uh, how do we decide if the patient has had a seizure. Um, and whether the patient qualifies for a uh, diagnosis of epilepsy. Okay, the first case is a 27-year-old man presented after experiencing an episode of loss, aware, uh, loss of awareness. His friend reported that he had been uh, eating dinner when he acutely stared off, which was followed by lip smacking, chewing, and clenching of his left hand. The total event lasted about uh, 90 seconds. He then appeared confused and was back to baseline approx approximately 10 minutes after the episode began. Um, the past medical history was notable for a prolonged febrile seizure at age of 18 months, but was otherwise unremarkable. He took no medications, no family history of seizures. He drank two to three glasses of wine per week no tobacco use or illicit drug use. Uh, physical and neurological examinations were unremarkable. So that's the history part. Um, the, here are the MRI result and EEG result. So on MRI, you can, so this is a uh, coronal flare, right? And you can see on the coronal flare, uh, we have a right uh, hi, uh, hyper intense signal change in the right hippocampus. Uh, which is, um, you know, a uh, indication. Sometimes you can see that kind of change after a uh, uh, seizure event. And on EEG, we have a sharp wave from the left, uh, right temporal chain, which correlates with our image finding. Okay, both are from located, localized to the right temporal region. Okay, so in that case, this patient, um, the symptom, you know, is convincing that um, the patient just had a seizure. And he, the, the onset is most likely focal. And he had impaired awareness. And this patient had a motor onset, which is the uh, oral automatism, lip smacking, chewing, and later he clenched his feet, a hand. Um, then does this patient qualifies for epilepsy. So remember we said when patient had a unprovoked seizure and abnormal EEG or abnormal MRI, then the risk of that patient having recurrent seizures within the next 10 years will be more than 60%. In that case, patient can be di uh, diagnosed with epilepsy. So in this case, he, he does qualify for that. And, and we can say this patient has epilepsy. And most likely, the patient has a right temporal, right temporal lobe epilepsy. The second case, a 13-year-old girl presented for evaluation after experiencing a single generalized sonic colonic seizure that occurred in the morning upon awakening. Her history revealed for the past, for the past year, she would often drop her toothbrush in the morning time. And her past medical history, pa uh, family history were both unremarkable. Uh, she had her per first uh, period uh, at age of 12. She took no medications, uh, no history of alcohol, tobacco, or illicit drug use. Uh, and her physical neurological examinations were unremarkable. Um, so this history uh, is already, you know, um, suggestive of a syndrome. Um, I, I'm not sure whether you've uh, heard of a syndrome called juvenile myoclonic epilepsy because, uh, you know, this, this history actually is sort of classic. Uh, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, is, by, by name, you can tell this uh, occurs more uh, often in teenage uh, age group. 
and the patient typically frequently report a uh, jerking movement in the morning uh, in the morning time after they wake up. Sometimes the the jerking can be so intense that they can drop stuff. For example, in this case, the patient dropped the toothbrush. Sometimes they can throw their uh, spoon box, uh, you know, away when they were uh, when they're taking uh, breakfast. Um, and, and also the EEG, um, you know, gives us a hint as well. So you can see this EEG. This patient had a burst of generalized. This is, you know, because you can see these abnormal discharge all over the place in, in involving every single channel that's uh, generalized. And it's a spike and slow wave complex. And if you count how many in one second, this is about four hertz in one second. So this is also a classic finding in juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, which is uh, uh, typically show a four to six hertz generalized spike and wave discharges uh, or polyspike and wave discharges. So in that case, um, this patient has a generalized onset seizure and most likely juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, when the patient has a epilepsy syndrome, automatically they qualify for the diagnosis. They qualify for the diagnosis of epilepsy. So even though this patient only had a single seizure, we can say this patient is uh, uh, most likely have uh, juvenile uh, myoclonic epilepsy. Okay, so that's the first level of the uh, this, uh, the classification of the 2017 system, which is a seizure classification. Uh, we can divide seizures into focal onset, generalized onset, or unknown onset. And, there are, and then there is a second level of classification. So once the patient uh, meets criteria for epilepsy, we then need to class classify their epilepsy type. And the epilepsy type is similar to seizure type which is also uh, divided into a focal onset, a generalized onset. However, there's a extra one, which is a combined generalized and focal onset, which means the patient may have both a generalized onset seizure and a focal onset seizure type. Um, you know, even though this doesn't uh, occur often, but it's, it can be seen in our clinical practice. Uh, and again, uh, we have unknown, uh, unknown onset epilepsy type. Okay, so that's the second level of classification um, designated by the uh, 2017 uh, naming system. And then there is a third level of epilepsy syndrome. Uh, okay. And so we talked about the, the seizure class, classification and uh, uh, the epilepsy classification, right? And now that you, you now that let's say you are uh, you are in practice, you have a patient presenting to you um, with a first onset seizure, and most likely in that case, patient will be brought to a emergency room. Um, and in that uh, in that setting, uh, we we need to. Um, you know, decide whether the patient needs to be admitted or can be worked up as an outpatient and whether the patient needs to be treated right away or can, we can wait. So this uh, flow chart shows you, uh, you know, how to uh, uh, approach a patient with uh, the first onset seizure, okay? So in, first of all, you need to decide whether there's um, uh, the, the, the description of the symptom is consistent with seizure. Because sometimes the, the history may, may not be that uh, you know, clear and the patient may actually just have a, a syncope or maybe the patient just had a complex migraine headache or the patient may be having a transient, a transient ischemic attack. Um, so the, all those needs to be ruled out. And you know, um, part, uh, this is gonna be your part of your differential diagnosis. Um, after you have ruled out all the others and determined the patient actually did have a seizure then you need to make sure you get, get a detailed history and a physical examination. And if there is a evidence of um, fever, focal deficit on your examination, or the patient has um, um, prolonged mental status change, that will prompt, will prompt a uh, urgent evaluation, um, uh, meaning that you need to get uh, labs, urgent CT, or maybe even urgent MRI, 
urgent EEG, and uh, the patient should be admitted to the hospital for, for the evaluation. However, if the patient uh, you know, seems to be stable, already uh, started to, to recover, going back to baseline, um, then um, we can you know, sort of uh, uh, slow down the urgency, right? Um, you, you first, um, you need to find out uh, again from history if, uh, and lab, if there's any provoking factors such as uh, sleep deprivation, alcohol use, certain medications or drug use. Um, in this uh, patient, if you, you identify some provoking factors, um, you can hold off um, on treatment, um, but do the, uh, the further workup as an outpatient, which will include a um, EEG and MRI as an outpatient. Um, and if the EEG and MRI are uh, normal, you don't need to do anything uh, after a first unprovoked seizure. Uh, you can hold off the treatment um, and just continue your clinical monitoring. However, if the patient had a um, abnormal EEG or abnormal MRI or both, then the patient should be paid, uh, put on medication uh, because they already qualify for epilepsy diagnosis. Okay. Um, so some note, um, the acute brain insults can have a risk of leading to late seizures in up to 20% of patients. And they, uh, in that setting, they, uh, they do not warrant prolonged uh, seizure prophylaxis, even if the injury was associated with early seizures or status. Exceptions are possibly a penetrating head trauma and herpes encephalitis. These situations are associated with a higher risk, about 50% risk of developing seizures and uh, epilepsy in a later stage. So in that case, you may want to put patients on uh, medication uh, for a longer uh, prolonged treatment. Okay. Um, so here are some uh, video clips I, I prepared. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, um, when patients presented with a episode of seizure-like event, you, you need to differentiate whether this is actually a seizure or something else. Um, syncope is a common um, presentation that uh, may trigger uh, a, a seizure workup. We, we got referral from uh, ER or the other uh, providers for, uh, for you know, workup a lot when they presented with, uh, you know, like a passing out event. Here is an example of the, um, a patient with basal vagal syncope. Um, and um, you know, I'm gonna show you the video so you can tell why this patient got referred and ad actually admitted, okay, sorry, doesn't mean to do that, and admitted to the hospital for, for workup. Okay. Um, so here you can see the patient is sitting in bed talking. The, the medical staff is, is um, you know, getting a blood draw. Uh, no, actually placing IV. Um, and you can see the EEG was fine. I, I, I'm sorry for the blurriness, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you the EEG was fine over here. And um, gradually you can see her head slide, slided towards the left and she opened her eyes, eyes rolled up and she has a dystonic posturing of her arms. And look at the EEG. So I don't know whether you look, I'm gonna bring back the, so look at here. So here her eyes rolled up and she's about to, to extend her arms in a, in a second. Look at the EEG. The EEG is totally flat, okay? So this is not a uh, epileptic pattern. Um, the, the patient basically had a visual vagal syncope from the pain, um, and that caused a transient um, um, decreased uh, perfusion, blood perfusion to the brain, and that caused this flattening of the EEG um, signal. Um, so in that case, you know, I have to say, if you just have the, the, the video of this, it's, it's going to be hard to tell whether the patient is having a seizure or, or syncope, but EEG is very helpful in this case. Um, another example, these are healthy volunteers. They are doing hyperventilation um, in a squatting position, and then they stood up quickly. 
that cause a, a visual vagal syncope as well. And you can see that then the patient started jerking around, but you see the jerking was not rhythmic, it's irregular, it's on and off. You know, this is different from um, the epilepsy type, which is typically a, a more of a rhythmic, regular and con continue, repetitive, not this on and off, you know, uh, pattern of jerking, you know. And here is a example of um, generalized onset atonic seizure. So um, again, the, the video clip here and EEG over here. You can see uh, the patient was sitting in bed, EEG was fine, nothing, nothing concerning. And see, all of a sudden, he, he lost muscle tone, right? He dropped his coffee, coffee club, cup, his head dropped. And you can see the EEG showed oh, over here is, I guess it's more clear, but basically the EEG showed a diffuse fast frequency activity, similar here, you know, and that's brief. And see, as soon as this, these charges stopped, he regained his um, muscle tone and, and regained his uh, movement and stuff. You know, this this can be dangerous. People people can fall and get injured uh, from the fall. You know, so that's the seizure uh, types and stuff. Um, here's another type uh, example of our uh, focal onset seizure. Um, yes. This patient, this patient is, has rather subtle signs of a complex partial seizure to the extent the staff member interviewing him does not initially So you can see the, the, the chewing, lift smacking, which is the automatism. See the, the, the movement of the hand that's repetitive, but purposeless. And he continued to, to have this chewing he moment. Blankly and begins rubbing his eyes. Then exhibits other automatisms, such as a fanning motion with his right arm. Initially, bursts of spike and slow wave activity are seen in both hemispheres. However, no clinical changes are seen. Later, rhythmic activity builds in the left temporal region, and the patient begins smacking his lips together. See that hand? And you can see the spikes building up. What's your name? Tell me what your name is. Okay. Raise your hands up in the air. Put your hands up. Okay. So he seems to be following commands, but he's not really answering questions. Okay. So I think that. That's good enough. Um, so to summarize, when we evaluate epilepsy, uh, we we need to determine uh, first of all we need to determine whether the symptom is convincing to be a seizure or not. And if the patient is determined to have seizure, uh, we we need to uh, classify whether the patient has a focal onset or generalized onset or or a combination. Um, this um, to determine that we can use some um, um, you know um, studies to help us, such as EEG, MRI, uh, to see if, if we find any uh, uh, localizing um, uh, evidence. And certainly, we need to um, find out what's the underlying etiology. Uh, the patient may have some structural abnormality or. This, you know, in, in uh, generalized onset seizures, uh, the patient may have a metabolic problem or genetic issues running in the family. And sometimes the patient may have infectious um, etiology uh, being the underlying cause and uh, or uh, often immune problem. Uh, we're going to talk about that in, in the later slides as well. Uh, and when we um, take care of patients with epilepsy, we also need to make sure we, we uh, uh, you know, 
go into the detail of their uh, comorbidities. Um, it's very common for the seizure patients to have depression and a lot of them uh, will have um, headache. Um, so all those can, uh, and uh, also another common complaint is a memory change. So all these needs to be addressed uh, when they are, uh, when you're uh, taking care of a patient with epilepsy. Okay. Um, and um, in a, uh, in pediatric population, uh, certainly um, we uh, frequently encounter patients who qualifies for a diagnosis of epilepsy syndrome. And these are all the, the, the known epilepsy syndrome listed um, based on uh, age. Um, I, I, I won't go into detail, um, but I just want to mention that uh, in the uh, a pediatric population, and sometimes even in adult population, uh, you know, bear in mind uh, that we may want to get a genetic study. Uh, the, uh, this may have a higher yield uh, in uh, patients with positive family history. Uh, however, um, the, the risk uh, of a patient uh, who has a positive, uh, positive family history is not like super high. For a child of a mother with epilepsy, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the risk for uh, that patient to have um, epilepsy is about 2.8 to 8.7. Um, and if the, uh, the father has epilepsy, the, the risk actually is lower. Uh, it's going to be 1% to 3.6%. But still is, um, um, you know, uh, getting a genetic study um, may help us to, to identify uh, whether the patient has a problem uh, in that case. And, and sometimes patient will appreciate that piece of information. Um, as I mentioned, sometimes the patient may have uh, autoimmune being the underlying etiology for their uh, epilepsy. Um, this is actually uh, getting more and more recognized um, in later, uh, in recent years. Um, one reason is because we, we you know, um, we have uh, more tools to detect the autoantibodies uh, in the serum and in the CSF. Um, in particular, we typically send uh, the um, specimens to a Mayo Clinic where they developed uh, panels to test for these autoantibodies. Um, and a lot of the, the cases uh, with autoimmune disease, patient may have some underlying acute uh, uh, malignancy going on. And that is a separate issue. Uh, certainly you need to, to do workups to rule that out. But first we need to identify if the patient has a uh, circulating autoantibody in their uh, system. Um, and uh, the, uh, the Mayo Clinic actually generates a, a, a clinical uh, a screening score system. It's called AD2 score. Um, and if the patient had a total score of more than four, uh, the sensitivity is about 98%. Um, the specificity was a little bit lower, like maybe 85%. However, if the, uh, it, uh, the score is more than seven, both the uh, sensitivity and specificity are quite high. The specificity can be increased to more than uh, 95%. Um, so um, some, some, some scoring um, points I, need, uh, I want to point out is new onset rapid progressive mental status change. That's one, one indication this patient has a high risk of having autoimmune uh, etiology. Uh, or the patient have a uh, automated uh, uh, autonomic dysfunction, or if the, uh, the seizure is, you know, uh, refractory uh, to, to medications uh, soon after the seizure onset. Um, or, you know, of course, if the, the MRI has suggesting features such as uh, hyper-intense signal change, of uh, T2 flare signal change restricted to one or both mesiotemporal lobe. This, you know, um, some some uh, other specific findings. Uh, certainly, I uh, you I won't go into further details. But this is a useful score system that we can identify people who who may warrant a further uh, evaluation uh, other than just MRI and EEG. Okay, so. Um, once the patient has a uh, established diagnosis of seizures, we need to treat them with anti-seizure medications. Um, and we have different types of anti-seizure medications. Uh, this diagram shows you the, um, the mechanism of uh, different medications. But, but generally speaking, um, the medications we use for seizure control um, can either um, 
in, um, enhance the GABA system, which is the, uh, the inhibitory pathway, uh, or suppress the excitatory pathway. So basically, just we want just want to make sure we suppress the uh, excitability of the uh, of the uh, uh, abnormal fire firing neurons. So based on the mechanism, we can further divide the medications into sodium channel blockers, calcium channel blockers. Um, medications working on GABA-A receptor, we're working on the glutamate receptor, MPA receptor, or potassium channels. Um, a large group of the uh, currently available medications fall into this sodium channel blocker, okay, uh, which is uh, which includes the um, lamotrigine, uh, oxacarbazepine, um, carbamazepine, um, phenytoin, all these are, you know, have our main, main uh, you know, commonly used sodium channel blockers. Um, and, and for uh, another reason, we also separate the medications into either a broad spectrum anesthesia medication or narrow sp spectrum anesthesia medication. Typically speaking, the narrow spectrum is only indicated, primarily indicated for use in focal onset seizures. Um, they may not be good for uh, generalized onset seizure. On the other hand, the broad spectrum and seizure medications can be used in both focal and generalized onset seizures. Um, some exceptions uh, under the narrow spectrum. And there are some evidence um, that uh, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, phenobarbital, uh, carbamazepine, phenytoin, primidone, if these are used uh, for uh, generalized onset tonic, clonic seizures, um, they, they may worsen certain type, you know, um, mainly they may worsen mild clonic type of seizures or atonic. So it, it, you, even though they can be used for generalized ton, uh, onset seizures, uh, you need to be cautious uh, about these types of uh, generalized onset seizures. In that case, you need you should be uh, you know avoiding the use of that. Um, and uh, lamotrigine, lamotrigine is um, considered a broad spectrum uh, anti seizure medication, which means that can be used in both focal and generalized onset seizure. However, uh, lamotrigine may worsen or precipitate mild chronic seizure. So in that case, you you may want to choose something different within this column. Um, one very special medication I want to point out is, is, uh, is this ethosuximide. The uh, brand name is Zerontin. So this medication is uh, considered a very narrow spectrum. It only has indication for use in the uh, childhood uh, syndrome of uh, absence seizure. Okay. Um, you, you know, uh, you may run into uh, situations where people interchange the term of absence seizure and um, the focal onset seizure with impaired awareness, in, you know, uh, because they are actually different. Um, if the patient had a staring episode, even though they they are sort of, you know, zoned out, similar with similar semiology to the absence seizure, uh, they they have actually different onset type because the focal onset seizure with impaired awareness is a focal onset seizure. And um, the absence seizure is a generalized onset seizure. And the absence seizure, the uh, syndrome is typically seen in childhood, uh, not so much, uh, you know, as a newly onset seizure type in adulthood. So that's the difference. Um, this medication certainly will not be a good indication for patients with focal onset with impaired awareness. So that's one thing I want to point out. Um, so even though you may have a, a good selection and the patient is, is very compliant with medications, um, the two, uh, you know, um, we, we, we still have uh, about one third of patients um, who are not able to be controlled by just medications. Um, the, um, of course, and a lot of the times when patients present to, um, a emergency room for uh, breakthrough seizures, uh, medication non-compliance is a major issue. And, and that's the reason we, we, we need to check levels when they present to the emergency room uh, with a breakthrough seizure. We need to find out whether they, they are 
you know, taking the medications consistently. Uh, otherwise, um, we typically do not really monitor seizure medication concentration on, uh, you know, like routinely, uh, only in certain situations. Um, and in those patients who, who cannot be controlled by um, anti-seizure medications, then we need to consider whether this patient can be a surgical candidate. Um, the definition for um, refractory epilepsy is when patients uh, has failed more than two anti-seizure medications uh, with an optimal dosage. Um, the, um, those patients you know, certainly will, will um, need further evaluation. Uh, the formal practice guideline in epilepsy um, actually was published in 2003 jointly by the American Academy of Neurology, um, American Epilepsy Society, and American Association of Neurological Surgeons. Um, and the guideline um, indicates that patients who, for whom uh, appropriate trials of first-line AEDs have failed should be considered for referral to a epilepsy surgery center. So um, that means when um, we, we receive a lot of uh, referrals and like that. Um, okay. Um, so when we receive a patient um, who's referred to us uh, for this purpose, we need to first confirm the diagnosis of epilepsy, right? And we need to rule out some other non-epileptic events. Um, and um, the, uh, that certainly requires the patient to be monitored uh, for seizure classification. And um, after we have confirmed the patients do have epilepsy, then we, we need to uh, trigger their seizures, capture those on EEG, and determine where the seizures come from. Um, and some patients may have a straightforward uh, finding from the evaluation. And, you know, for example, the patient may have a, uh, you know, EEG finding to suggest seizures are coming from the left temporal region. And EE, uh, MRI showed a abnormal structural lesion over the left temporal region. Um, then we may provide the patient to, uh, you know, uh, present the case to surgeon uh, directly for, for surgical resection. However, sometimes, um, you know, the, the data may not be concordant uh, or if the patient may have a multifocal onset on EEG, or if the you know if we only see EEG findings but uh, image is normal, in that case, um, patients will certainly need more um, you know a further in-depth evaluation. And in that case, we most likely will uh, get a second phase um, monitoring uh, require you know using a intracranial electrodes. And the intracranial electrodes can be either a subdural grids, scripts or um, depth electrode. Um, a stereo EEG is a commonly used um, intracranial monitoring these days, which can, you know, in that case, we can avoid opening the skull. It's, it's less invasive uh, for, uh, during the monitoring phase. And after that, we, uh, you know, we, we can present the data and, and further determine whether the patient will be a surgical uh, candidate to present to the surgeon or the patient may, may not have a good spot to be identified for resection, then they, they can either be considered for um, neurostimulation, um, you know, um, or sometimes we, we may not really uh, be able to offer anything or maybe even a palliative a resective surgery. So in terms of uh, neurostimulation, um, Oh, okay, here, oh, first of all, let's, let me just show some, some images of how we do the second phase intracranial monitoring. This picture shows the uh, subdural grids. Um, I, you know, this is a surgical bed that you can see in, this, in the OR and uh, X-ray shows that the grid is located in the uh, temporal region. Um, and here is a procedure of the stereo EEG where we implant the depth electrode into the, uh, the locations where we think the seizure onset zone is, okay? And uh, like I mentioned, some patients may not be a good resective surgery candidate. And in that case, we may consider neuromodulation. Um, and the current available neuromodulation uh, therapy for epilepsy are RNS, DBS, and VNS. The RNS is a responsive uh, neurostimulation. Uh, 
for, for a patient to, to be a candidate, the, uh, we, we need to find, uh, identify the seizure onset. And if we can have, uh, if the patient has like maybe two spots identified, the surgeon can implant the electrode into those places. Um, and as of now, the RNS can only be used to stimulate two independent foci, okay? Because we can only connect two wires. It can be uh, two strips or two depth electrodes or a combination of one of each, okay? Um, and if, however, sometimes, sometimes the patient may, may have multifocal, it, you know, certainly we cannot really stimulate every single spot, a spot of, uh, in, in, within the brain. And in that case, maybe uh, we can consider DBS. Um, and uh, people have tried to, to stimulate different uh, uh, nucleus uh, within the thalamus, but uh, the currently approved, FDA approved uh, foci of stimulation um, based on Sante trial is the uh, anterior, anterior nucleus um, of the thalamus uh, and, and um, ATN. Okay, so this one is what we are, uh, you know, practicing uh, lately for uh, refractory epilepsy patients who are considered uh, multifocal. Um, sometimes, you know, we may not really offer anything but the, but to offer a VNS. Um, the uh, VNS is the certainly will be the least invasive uh, because the the surgeon will just implant a generator in the upper chest wall and uh, on the left. And then the wire will be um, wrapped around the left vagus nerve. The reason we chose the left vagus nerve is because the left vagus has less um, uh, effect, uh, effect on the cardiovascular system. So we don't need to worry about um, you know, arrhythmia and stuff. And, th and then the, um, the stimulation will be sent into the brain uh, through the uh, wide connection of the vagus nerve within, with different uh, brain structures, okay? So those are the options of uh, our neuromodulation. Um, so, so these are the, the treatment for, for epilepsy, but um, at, at the at the, uh, towards the last, I'm gonna talk about a very commonly seen um, seizure mimicker which is the non-epileptic episodic event. Um, again, there are several different terms. Um, sometimes uh, we, we can call that psychogenic non-epileptic seizure. Personally, I don't really like this term because some, you know, some patients may get offensive to the term of psychogenic. And also the, the term seizure, in my opinion, really means specific things, right? As I mentioned in the first slide, seizure has this specific definition. So I really do not want to confuse patients uh, about what they have because the, uh, the, the non-epileptic events basically is not due to abnormal brain firing, right? Um, this is more of a mental health problem to, uh, you know, uh, rather than a neurological. However, it's really com commonly seen in, uh, you know, in our uh, seizure cl uh, clinics. Um, the, uh, the patient uh, may have some psych uh, psychi uh, psychiatric disorder, um, um, you know, to be, uh, you know, to be identified. Uh, they may have a dissociation, conversion disorder, you know, um, but they, they, we consider this problem as a unconscious, subconscious behavioral change, okay, not, uh, which is different from the malignoring, okay. The patient is, re is really not doing this for a second gain. Um, you know, uh, and statistically, this, this disorder seems to be more occurring in uh, females than males. Um, and sometimes the epileptic and non-epileptic events can, can coexist. And in that case, we need to um, make sure patients understand their symptoms. Uh, and also we need to educate the family members to uh, identify different types of events so they don't get over anxious and, uh, you know, uh, and, and bring patients to ER unnecessarily. Um, the video EEG monitoring certainly is the, the, the best tool to, to help us identify what they have. And um, the, the recommended treatment for, for these events are certainly are not anti-seizure medications they should be referred to psychologists and psychiatrists. The psychologist is mainly just uh, for them to get counseling to, to you know, uh, 
uh, handle their underlying uh, either underlying anxiety or maybe depression and psychiatrist can help uh, neurologists manage their uh, and psychiatric medications. Um, and uh, maybe, uh, you know, roughly about 50% of these patients may respond well to uh, specific psychiatric treatment. Um, and then um, the, the frequency of these events will reduce. Some patients may even stop having these, uh, although it's really hard to make them event-free uh, in most occasions. So there are some clinical signs um, to help us identify patients um, with uh, non-epileptic events just based on the history and semiology. Um, the patient you know, may tell you that the, the, uh, the movement is waxing and weaning and fluctuate. Um, and usually the, the duration may be uh, prolonged. And uh, most importantly, um, you know, the patients have their, you know, if the patient has eyes closed, most likely, you know, I would say, you know, I should say definitely this patient will, uh, has non epileptic events. Although some non epileptic events, uh, patients may have their eyes open during the episodes. However, if they do have eyes closed, that's quite clear, they don't have seizures, okay? And some of them may have ictal crying and um, the movement of their um, jerking or maybe just shaking is more of an asynchronous manner rather than a synchronous jerking. A, a specific movement that is commonly seen in non epileptic event is a pelvic thrusting. Um, and patients may recall uh, what they have, um, even though they appear to be unresponsive during the events. However, a lot of the times may, patients may tell you that I don't remember what happened. And they may hyperventilate during the episode. And even though they may also bite their tongue, however, in non epileptic events, patients tend to bite the tip of the tongue rather than the side of the tongue in comparison to a epileptic events. Okay. Um, so some uh, there, so these are uh, some further uh, comparison between epileptic and non-epileptic in terms of age of onset and you know sex difference, uh, sex uh, underlying psychiatric histories, um, you know the motor symptom uh, features. As I mentioned, patient with non-epileptic may have more of a flailing, thrashing asynchronous movement, um, and they may, they may have um, head, head thrust, you know, like head shaking side to side, head nodding, pelvic thrusting. These are all some classic features of a non-apneptic non movement. Um, and the vocalization will be different from the apneptic events because, they, you know, patients may scream uh, rather than a uh, a, a ictal cry um, and um, you know urinary incontinence is not a absolute sign of epileptic events. Uh, patients with uh, non-epileptic events can have that even though it may not be frequent. However, it's, it can happen, okay. Um, and um, the um, you know whether patients remember or not varies a lot in non-epileptic patients. However, in epileptic patients, they don't remember typically. Um, so next, now I'm gonna show you some examples uh, of these non-epileptic events. So you can tell how, how dramatic, how strong the shaking can be. You can see the patient is you know, rolling from side to side and then went back to this um, pelvic thrusting and then started rolling side to side again, you know, it just changed, uh, you know, alternating between the two uh, different kind of events of shaking. And you can see the shaking of the legs are asynchronous, right? Um, and, he, and he also has this back arching and it's quite prolonged. Quite intense. And you can see it's on and off. He had a short break, like very brief break, and then started again. Okay, another uh, example. 
this patient is uh, getting photic stimulation. And he, she most likely may have already reported the patient may have an aura actually, because you can see she's trying to, to search the button to push. And then she started shaking. This is a classic thrust, a pelvic thrusting, which is a commonly seen shaking type in non epileptic events. And then see that the, the, the flailing of the left arm is sort of on and off, right? And she's not responding. So she appears to be unresponsive. So she, yeah. So be careful about that. You know, sometimes they can appear to be atonic and they may, you know, they may have the arm falling on the face and hit themselves quite hard. So be careful about that. Okay. So she's still not responding. Yeah. So you can tell the difference, right? Um, the so uh, just uh, so in summary, the uh, AAN um, have some guidelines for, for uh, practice uh, in uh, epilepsy uh, management and evaluation. Um, the adults presenting with a unprovoked first seizure should be informed that their chance for a recurrent seizure is greatest within the first two years after the first seizure, which is a level A evidence. Um, and clinicians should also advise patients that clinical factors associated, associated with an increased risk for seizure recurrence include prior brain insult, such as a stroke or trauma, which is again a level A evidence, an EEG with epileptic form abnormalities, level A evidence, and a significant brain imaging uh, abnormality, which is a level B or a, a nocturnal seizure in the past, uh, which is also a level B. Okay, and clinicians should also advise patients that um, although immediate AED therapy um, is likely to reduce the risk for seizure recurrence in the first two years, it may not improve quality of life. And we should also advise patient that over the longer term, immediate EED treatment is unlikely to improve prognosis for sustained seizure remission. And they should also be advised that their risk for um, side effects from AEDs ranges from 7% to 31%. It's quite high actually and that these uh, advice, uh, adverse effects are predominantly mild and reversible. Um, so basically they should not that get discouraged from taking the medication. We should also, always encourage them to, to give it a, a good try of these seizure meds, okay? So in summary, uh, after the patient, uh, when a patient present to you uh, with a first unprovoked seizure, uh, you know, first you need to determine if that events represent a seizure. And if they are, you need to do workup, including MRI and EEG. Um, and that can help you determine uh, if the patient should be treated or not. Um, and um, if the patient qualifies for epilepsy, um, we need to classify the seizure type, epilepsy type, and that can help us to, to determine which type of seizure anti-seizure anti medications may be a good option in that patient's case. And after you tried the medications um, and patient has been compliant, um, and then however, unfortunately they failed more than two medications at a optimal dosage and stuff, um, you need to consider whether the patient should be referred to a uh, comprehensive epilepsy center for surgical evaluation. Um, and for those patients, they should be uh, monitored in EMU de to determine what kind of uh, surgical option can be provided uh, for their uh, better seizure control. Okay, and certainly the EMU monitor can, is also used for diagnostic uh, purpose, such as when you have a patient with suspected non epileptic events, you should get them monitored so that they don't get treated with medications. Um, they should be referred to psychologists and psychiatrists instead, okay? So I think that's my last slide.